Good morning and welcome to this week's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. We're pleased to have Ms. Lizzie Presser joining us as our speaker today. First, a few reminders. CME credit is available for today's talk. And if it's your first time joining us and you haven't registered yet, we'll be posting a link in the chat for you to get signed up. We are not offering MOC credit at this time. Please also use the chat feature to post any questions that you have for our speaker throughout the presentation. At the end, I will read them aloud for our speaker to respond to. I'd now like to welcome Dr. Josh Beckman, Professor of Medicine and Director of Vascular Medicine to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Funk. This is such a pleasure for me. Um, as someone who's been in the vascular game now for a couple of decades, it's been, it's been appreciated uh, that there is a significant increased risk of amputation in Black Americans. And we tell this story in medical meetings and to our trainees but honestly, we don't really seem to be able to penetrate the consciousness of the public. It is my incredible pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce to you someone who literally with one story has not just punctured the national consciousness, but made more strides than any of us combined uh, in an incredibly short period of time. Lizzie Presser was graduated from Princeton University with a BA in the classics and Cambridge University with a master's in public policy. She's an investigative journalist at ProPublica where her work has been awarded a George Polk Award in journalism and magazine reporting and John Bartlow Martin Award for public interest magazine journalism. She writes about health, healthcare and how social policy is experienced. It is my great pleasure to be able to introduce Ms. Lizzie Presser who will be discussing the black American amputation epidemic. Thank you so much, Josh, for that generous introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here. So thank you for having me. So as Josh mentioned, I am writing, I'm talking to you today about a story I wrote in May called The Black American Amputation Epidemic. And I wrote it for ProPublica. I'm gonna start by talking about a person who's at the center of the story. And his name is Henry Dotstree. You can see him in the image here. Dotstree grew up in Bolivar, Mississippi. It's deep in the Delta. Um, he left school in the eighth grade to help his parents bring in more income. And he spent most of his life driving tractor trailers without any health insurance. He was diagnosed with type two diabetes at the age of 60. Although his family members would say that there were signs that he was unwell long before then. When he was diagnosed, um, he didn't quite understand how he could best manage his condition. He couldn't read well, and he had trouble managing his insulin and his blood sugar levels. So a couple of years after he was first diagnosed, he suffered a stroke. And following that, he no started to notice that on his right leg, he could see that his toes were darkening. And when he went to the hospital, Eventually, the surgeons recommended an amputation at the ankle without doing any um, arterial testing in the meantime. That infection that was in his foot then spread up his leg. And a few weeks later, he had an amputation below his knee, as you can see in this photo. I, kept, I met uh, Mr. Dodgery in February of 2020. And at this point, he had been readmitted to a hospital, Bolivar Medical Center. Um, he was 67 years old, and now there was a problem with his left foot. And I could see very clearly that he was, it was oozing right underneath his toes, and you could really smell the rot of flesh on his toes as well. Um, the last thing Henry wanted was to lose his left leg. Uh, the surgeons first did an ultrasound or someone did an ultrasound at the hospital and it showed poor circulation and the surgeons believed that they would have to amputate that leg below the knee. Um, part of the problem is that if he lost another leg below the knee, he would be in a wheelchair, uh, which would mean most likely that someone in his family would have to take off work uh, and care for him, whether that was part-time, three-quarters of the time, full-time. And there was no one in his family in Bolivar who had the financial wherewithal to do that. And so when I was meeting Henry, I was also sitting with his family that was trying to figure out, well, if Henry loses his leg, what are we gonna do? 
And the only thing that some of them could agree on was that he might have to go move to Texas with his daughter where he knew no one else. And that possibility was devastating to everyone in the family and very difficult even for Henry to get his head around. It wasn't something he wanted to do. So I'm going to leave you with that bit of Henry's case and I'm gonna return to him later on in the presentation. So I just wanted to back up and let you know how I'm structuring this talk. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on how I came to this story. Then I'm gonna to talk to you about the doctor I follow in the story, whose name is Dr. Felucio Facarede. Then I'm gonna walk you through the systemic variable, barriers to equitable care for on amputations that Dr. Facarede found in his work and that I was able to witness when I shadowed him for a month. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the personal barriers as well. I'm gonna to return to Mr. Dot Street and then I'm gonna talk more specifically about how to make systemic change and what we can learn from this particular case. So this is an image of the diabetes belt. Um, about 34 million Americans have diabetes. And I wanted to take the year to look at diabetes, which is the most expensive chronic condition in the country. We spend $237 billion in medical care on diabetes a year, and one in every four healthcare dollars is spent on someone with diabetes. And it doesn't need to be that way. I was particularly interested in understanding how it could be that we have seen such great strides in medical care and medications for people with diabetes. And yet at the same time, we were seeing these complications of this chronic condition tick up. I didn't understand how that could be or why that was happening. And I was initially intrigued by that question. I was most disturbed to learn that diabetic amputations were on the rise. And so a study had recently come out that showed that the rate of amputations had risen 50% between 2009 and 2015. So last year alone, there were 130,000 diabetic amputations. And they're all low income and underinsured neighborhoods. One of the most startling and disturbing statistics that came along with that is that black patients were losing their limbs at three times the rate of everyone else. There's no reason for that. I was drawn to this acute complication because I, for the obvious reasons, it's a horrible way to suffer the complications of diabetes, but also your mortality rises after an amputation. Um, your mortality rises for a whole host of reasons, but part of it is that these patients often stop walking or stop walking as much. And we all know that exercise is what's going to improve circulation and help you control your blood sugar and also lose weight. And so the less activity that someone is doing, the higher the risk of heart attacks or strokes. So what I was learning is that within five years, patients who had a diabetic amputation or just an amputation, non-traumatic one, they were likely to die. So I was interested in exploring many facets of this story. One is just the slow violence of diabetes and how we can step in with better preventive care, but then also this very acute outcome so that I could understand how we can prevent unnecessary amputations. Um, and I wanted to go where it was particularly bad so I could examine how we got to this place and also how we could move forward. So I, I went to Mississippi, uh, which probably isn't a surprise to many people. It has some of the worst health outcomes in the country. It's one of the poorest states in the country as well. And I met Dr. Felucio Facarede. I, I actually, I met with a bunch of different doctors when I got down there, but I was drawn to Dr. Facarede because I had seen that he had written several op-eds on how unnecessary amputations were a matter of injustice 
And I was curious to meet someone who spoke with such strong language and clearly felt very strongly about the issue. Um, it took me a while to get in touch with him. He did not respond to my emails. So I showed up at his door and uh, over many conversations, we decided we would work together on a story and he would allow me to shadow him with patient consent. And so I spent about four weeks shadowing his practice. Uh, Dr. Fakarede is an interventional cardiologist. I'm gonna just give you a little background on him. He was born in Nigeria. He studied at Rutgers. He did his residency at Cornell Weill. He took his first job at um, a hospital in Tennessee or a clinic in Tennessee. And that's where he grew interested in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, he, like me, was interested in why the outcomes in Mississippi were so poor. And he had also heard anecdotes from people who were from Mississippi about a general mistrust of the medical system. And in particular, just a difficulty in finding black physicians and black specialists who patients in the Delta trusted. In fact, when he did a little bit more research, he realized that he could only find one other black interventional cardiologist in the entire state of Mississippi. So he starts practicing there in 2015 and he very quickly saw a problem. So as a cardiologist, he had patients who were coming to him with heart problems, but he'd been trained to ask his patients to take their socks off, even if they were coming in with chest pain and he would make sure to check their pulses. And he noticed that they were often very weak and that their calves were cold and hairless. And he also noticed that many of these patients had never had anyone do this before, ask about their legs, touch their feet like this. And he also noticed that many of them had been misdiagnosed. They had gotten diagnoses of arthritis or gout. And when he looked around, he realized that there were a number of problems in the region. One was that the primary care providers were really overwhelmed. Many were seeing far too many patients a day to prioritize feet or to know to prioritize feet. They could see a patient for five, 10, 15 minutes and they had a whole other list of things to get through. And he also noticed that there just weren't that many specialists around who could see his patients. So the National Loan Forgiveness Program really helps certain kinds of private practice providers, but not specialists as much. So even when he would see these patients who had uncontrolled diabetes or diabetes that just could be managed better, when he would try to get them to see an endocrinologist, he realized there wasn't one within a hundred miles of Bolivar County, a hundred miles. And this is the center of the diabetes epidemic. And yes, there were endocrinologists in Jackson, but many of them didn't take Medicaid. And for many of his patients, that's all they had. So this also applied to Dr. Fakridi. He wanted to start a practice there and wanted to start a lab there. But in order to do that, he would have to take on more debt on top of his student debt. Um, I also want to say that what he was realizing was that most of his patients just hadn't had a diagnosis of peripheral artery disease when it seemed to him that that's what they had and when he was able to check that indeed that was the diagnosis. So I just want to quickly step back and talk a little bit about peripheral artery disease and what it is. Um, I'm sure as most of you know, peripheral artery disease is when clogged arteries in the legs, in this case, are limiting the flow of blood. Um, it is one of the most morbid cardiovascular diseases and very few people talk about it. Less than a quarter of Americans have even heard the term and are aware of it. And that's because it is really a terrible term, peripheral artery disease. It doesn't mean anything to most people. And as Dr. Beckman likes to say, peripheral artery disease makes it sound like it's something you don't even need to think about. It's on the periphery. But really, it is an extraordinarily dangerous disease, especially if it is not caught and treated early. So there are about 8 to 12 million people in the United States who have peripheral artery disease. And about 50% of these patients are believed to be asymptomatic. And asymptomatic can mean a whole lot of things, but 
often it can mean that, sure, they have a little bit of pain walking, maybe, but they don't necessarily know what it is and it can kind of be anything in their minds. More than a half of these patients have trouble walking. And so diabetes is going to increase the risk of PAD like it does for any kind of atherosclerosis. And in particular, diabetes that can't be managed that well will do that. And plaque is gonna build up faster in your vessel's walls. And it's also a disease that is more prevalent with age, right? It's the same thing that's happening in your neck, which can cause a stroke, in your heart, which can cause a heart attack. And then in your legs, the risk is gangrene and an amputation. So this is a patient that uh, Dr. Fakhariti came to the hospital where Dr. Fakhariti was working and he has consent to share these photos. So the most complicated patients would come in through the emergency room. Dr. Fakhariti got credentialed at a nearby hospital, Bolivar Medical Center. And these were patients who typically had over a lifetime, just simply didn't have good access to healthcare. Um, many of these patients may have come to the hospital before but they had been treated with wound care or antibiotics and not offered revascularization. Um, maybe they simply weren't offered it and maybe they just couldn't pay for it. Uh, so then what would end up happening is that a wound that had started off maybe as something really tiny, like a nick of the toenail, um, even just cutting your nails would fester and be unable to heal because it wasn't getting blood from the vessels to deliver the nutrients it needed. And over time that infection would spread. And so this is an X-ray of someone who had come into the hospital and he had woken up from a nap and realized that his dog was eating the dead flesh off the tips of his toes. Often these are patients who by the time they get back to the ER, there is no choice but to amputate. And that's really what was driving Felucho, Dr. Fakhariti. How do I reach these patients? He was also particularly interested in this as a systemic issue, not just as a local one. So as you can see from these maps, the distribution of amputations is strikingly similar to the distribution of the enslaved population in 1860. That's disturbing and it really disturbed him. And he was interested in trying to figure out not just how do I reach people locally and change, turn this around really in Bolivar, but also how do I understand and disentangle the systemic barriers that are leading to this distribution of amputations and to the fact that black Americans are three times more likely than everyone else to suffer them. So to sum up, he discovered this problem that he didn't know he was going to find, which was this extraordinarily high rate of undiagnosed peripheral artery disease. And in the next section, I'm going to talk about the barriers he encountered to trying to address that problem. So I've laid out here five major systemic barriers. There are more, but I'm going to focus on these. Um, I'm going to talk to you about health insurance, the US Preventive Services Task Force, the guidelines on arterial testing and angiography before amputation, hospital practices and policies, and also financial incentives. I'm gonna start simply with health insurance. Um, black Americans in this country are simply less likely to be insured than white Americans. Uh, in the South, they're more likely to be living in states that haven't expanded Medicaid for the working poor. And this means that those who have diabetes are at a disadvantage, not just in terms of developing the condition, but in terms of managing it. They aren't seeing doctors as regularly or accessing the medication they need as easily as people who do have that health insurance. And if that diabetes is less likely to be well managed, it is more likely to cause complications like peripheral artery disease. 
So the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force was um, another major hurdle. So for those who are unaccustomed, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force was created in 1984. It is a volunteer panel of researchers and physicians who make recommendations based on evidence about clinical preventive services like screenings and preventive medicines. When this body does not in, does endorse a screening, let's start there, the law currently requires that insurers will cover that screening. If this task force does not endorse a screening, the law allows insurance providers not to cover it. In the case of peripheral artery disease, the US Preventive Services Task Force has found repeatedly that the evidence base is not strong enough. So it is insufficient evidence, they give it an I rating. And that is a problem for patients like the ones that Dr. Fakhridi is seeing. So the task force, I have a quote that's on here, said very clearly, these comments cited evidence that the prevalence of PAD is disproportionately higher among racial and ethnic minorities and low socioeconomic populations. And it noted that an I statement could discourage testing and perpetuate disparities in treatment and outcomes. And they wrote, the USPSTF recognizes these well-established disparities in care. And they called for more research in order to make a different recommendation there are a number of problems that come up with this kind of a recommendation. So the first is just the evidence base. So they are making recommendations based on evidence that is racially skewed. So according to the government, uh, to, the, to the federal government, only about 10% of people in clinical studies are racial minorities. If you look at African-American representation in clinical studies, some people say that it's about 5%. So we are basing our recommendations at the USPSTF on evidence that is already racially skewed towards white patients. That's one issue. Dr. Beckman, the director of vascular medicine here, was part of an external review of the evidence base. And what he was finding is that the panels or the task force's own kind of guidelines for reviewing evidence didn't line up necessarily or wasn't standardized in a way that he understood. So the task force had discounted one of the strongest studies or the strongest study that he had seen, which showed that um, testing and screening for PAD led to a reduction in mortality and hospital days which is a big deal. Um, he was also troubled by the fact that the recommendation that the US Preventive Services Task Force gave was for the general public and not for patients who were particularly at risk of PAD. Um, professional societies, when they make their guidelines are looking at an at-risk population. Catching this kind of a uh, complication, catching this disease, peripheral artery disease early, can mean getting patients on medications that have been shown to slow the progression of the disease. And it can also just mean bringing those patients into the system, teaching them to check their feet, to call a doctor immediately if they see a non-healing wound, or just any kind of wound that looks like troubling to them. And if you remember, 50% of these patients are asymptomatic. So it's really critical to be having those conversations early and to be watching the progression of PAD. So as a result of this um, insufficient evidence recommendation, there are many, many, many at-risk Americans who simply aren't being screened for peripheral artery disease. So the next thing I wanted to talk with you about is uh, society guidelines or just professional guidelines on arterial testing and angiography before amputation. So on the right, this is an example of um, a magnetic resonance angiogram. 
And I just wanna walk through what you can see in this. So if you look at the leg on the left, you see a very clear flow of blood through the femoral artery. And if you look at the leg on the right, you see that there's a block, right? The blood is not flowing through the superficial femoral artery. So when you do an angiogram like this, you have a roadmap, you see where the blockage is and you're able to determine whether or not you think you can open it back up. And the reason you need to do this is because if you have a wound on the, on the right foot in this photo, you need blood flow to heal it. You need the nutrients that blood carries to make sure that that wound is going to heal. So if you chop off that foot, if you amputate that foot and you have not fixed the underlying issue, which is this blockage in this femoral artery, the wound still isn't going to heal. There is still a risk that the infection will continue to spread. And there is still a risk of pain from this peripheral artery disease. So that's uh, my take on angiography, angiography, and I hope that's helpful in terms, in terms of looking at how an angiogram might actually help a physician understand what the problem is and if there is an underlying problem with the vessels that can be fixed. So you can do an angiogram as a non-invasive procedure or as a minimally invasive procedure. And then if you find that there is this blockage, you can clean it out in a number of different ways. You can use atherectomy, angioplasty, stents. And one of the things that I was finding in Mississippi and that Dr. Fakaridi had found years before is that there was this great divide between academic medicine and practices on the ground, particularly in rural America. So the vascular specialists, surgeons and cardiologists, their guidelines will recommend imaging of the arteries before amputation, but that wasn't happening. And even in national studies, 50% of Americans are not getting an angiogram before amputation, 50%. If you look just at arterial testing more generally, which will include some ultrasounds, 30% aren't getting any kind of arterial testing before an amputation. And in Mississippi, what Dr. Fakaridi was finding was that of his patients who had had amputations, it was more like 90% who had never been offered or received any kind of arterial testing or angiography more specifically before suffering an amputation. So what he was seeing was actually an amputation first strategy. When amputations have been determined that they should be the last strategy, right? We should do everything we possibly can do with modern medicine to save a limb before we cut one off. Of course, there are going to be instances in which surgeons will say, no, there are moments in which this is an emergency and we don't have time to schedule an angiogram. And sure, that seems to be the case, right? There's wet gangrene, there's the risk of sepsis. But those cases are a fraction, a really small fraction of the cases that Dr. Fakaridi was seeing. And really that most surgeons would tell you they were seeing, at least in my research of the topic, right? It's maybe 10%, 15%, and that might even be high. So, when I went to um, Dr. Gerard Herman, whose name I'm likely mispronouncing, she uh, was the chair of the PAD guidelines for the ACC and the AHA in 2016. And when I explained to her what I was seeing and tried to talk with her about angiography, she told me that angiography before amputation was a view that some of us thought was so obvious that it didn't need to be stated. And then she explained that she saw that there were pockets of the country where people just weren't getting angiograms and it seemed to be along racial and socioeconomic lines. And that made her feel sick to her stomach. So there is this great divide between what is happening in major medical centers and what's actually happening on the ground, particularly in rural America. So just to give you a sense of what uh, Dr. Herman is talking about, here is a map of revascularization prior to amputation. Um, 
as you can see, the yellower part, so here is the part of the country that has the highest rates of amputations. And it has pretty low rates of revascularization compared to the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, so the very patients who are most likely to be affected by amputation are also the least likely to get this kind of care, to get the, the opportunity to save that limb through a revascularization procedure. So if I haven't made this point clear enough, I'm gonna try one more time. So the probability of your amputation, it appears, is going to depend on a number of different factors. Your race and your ethnicity, as you can see in this photo, in this graph, white is a um, lower extremity revascularization, black is an amputation. If you are white in this country, you are much more likely to have a revascularization procedure than if you are non-white. It's going to depend on your income as well. As your income rises, you are far more likely to have a revascularization procedure. And it's going to depend on your insurance. If you have private insurance, you are more likely to have a revascularization procedure than if you have Medicaid or Medicare. It's also going to depend on geography. So yes, Mississippi, we all know, has very bad health outcomes. But you can really look at this at an even more granular level. And there was a fantastic study in 2014 out of California. And it found that the lowest income neighborhoods had the, high, had the highest rates of amputations and a rate that was 10 times higher than the highest income neighborhoods. So what you can see on this image is lower extremity amputations on the top and adults that are 200% below the federal poverty under 200% of the federal poverty level, excuse me, below, and how closely those maps line up. So yes, there are socioeconomic factors, but these are also patients who are likely not getting screened and brought into the system early. Patients who have less access to regular healthcare and the medications they need. Um, and just geographic access to healthcare sometimes as well. And so when they present with a wound, they are less likely to get a revascularization and more likely to get an amputation. And one of the authors of this study explained that he has stood beside the bedside of patients with diabetes and had to listen to residents say, you know, we have to cut off your foot to save your life. And these are patients who are the breadwinners for their families, um, who are raising young kids, people who have many productive years ahead of them, and they are about to lose a limb and potentially the ability to provide that same income for their families. Okay, so I've gone through my top three systemic barriers and I also just wanted to talk a little bit about hospital practices and policies and the financial incentives in this system. So hospitals often don't set requirements on this, right? It's kind of up to the physician to decide what is best. Um, and in this case, that can sometimes mean that a patient can come in and surgeons can decide that they would like to perform an amputation and that seems to be the best treatment without providing any kind of arterial testing beforehand. It's also that sometimes that's just the way things have been done. And so getting physicians to change their practices can be quite difficult. It's, it's a kind of inertia, it's a kind of way of practicing. And then on top of that, one thing that Dr. Paccaridi was finding and that I witnessed firsthand is that in many of these hospitals that are outside of major medical centers, you might not have a vascular surgeon or you might not have a vascular surgeon who's, um, who's particularly aggressive about legs. And so what you'll find is that a patient will be seen by a general surgeon instead. And a general surgeon will take a look at the ultrasound and, and try to understand what the factors are in the case. But at the end of the day, they do have a financial incentive to amputate because if they recommend a revascularization procedure, that is a surgery they are not being paid for. I know we don't like to talk about financial incentives in medicine, but this is a pretty clear one. And uh, I think it was also a difficult one to kind of get my head around as well. I wanted to talk a little bit about personal barriers too. Um, this is Luvenia Stokes, 
who I met when I was in Mississippi. She lost her right leg at the age of 48. Uh, she grew up in the Delta as well. She was diagnosed with diabetes as a kid. She lived in a food desert, didn't know much about the disease. And by the time I had met her, her grandmother had lost both of her legs above the knee. And actually very recently, her cousin had lost a leg and he lived right nearby. And she lived with her mom or rather her mom lived with her. And that was because her mom had so much pain walking that she was in a wheelchair. And she had never been diagnosed with peripheral artery disease or even heard the term. So when Luvenia met Dr. Fakaridi, that was also the first time she learned about peripheral artery disease, right? Again, no one knows what this is. She also learned that there was a procedure that could help her. She came in with just shooting leg pain. She couldn't sleep, the pain was so bad. This is in her left leg now. And she was shocked to discover that there was something that could be done to relieve her of that pain and also give her a shot to keep those vessels open so that she wouldn't suffer a non-healing wound and get an amputation. And not only was she shocked, but she was um, really angry that she had lost one leg and no one had told her then that there was potentially a procedure that could have been done to save it. Um, one of the things she said to me was, you know, they're not doing tests on us to save us and they're just cutting us off. And she found that extraordinarily disturbing as it should be. Um, so what you can see from Luvinia's case is there is this very low awareness of what this condition is and even what a patient knows to advocate for. So what Felucio has to do, getting to the second point on the slide, which is this very low level of PAD awareness, is he has to go into the community and speak to patients, or rather he chooses to, because he believes that if patients know what's happening to them, both the PAD and the amputations, they will be better advocates for themselves. And so he starts holding public events, speaking at churches, trying to get the word out that patients don't need to just simply accept amputation for strategies. They can actually ask for a second opinion and they can come to him if they want or go somewhere else if they want. Um, he puts up billboards as well. And he starts also speaking with physicians and he had done this all throughout his time there, but he really wanted to help physicians in the area also understand that there was another way to work with these patients. And that's really hard because what he was finding is that here he is, a guy from the Northeast coming down to the South, telling all these doctors who have been there forever, I know what to do. And they're starting to think, who are you to tell me what to do? I know what I do. And so that took a lot of work on his part. And what he would do ultimately was see patients that had been referred to him. And he would take x-rays um, or, or yeah, x-rays of their legs and he would send before and after photos to the patients, sorry, to the physicians. So he would say, here's your, here's your patient you sent me. This is what her arteries look like when I took a look. And here's what they look like after I cleared them out and her wound will now heal. And so it was through that kind of constant communication, sending studies, sending images of his results, sending patient stories that he was able to start showing and working with doctors in the region to help um, ensure that patients were first of all being screened and second of all getting the arterial testing they needed before an amputation. All right so now we are going to go back to Henry Dodgetree. So in the context of these systemic and personal barriers, how does Dr. Fakaridi end up reaching patients like Mr. Dostri, who I started this talk with? So he's initially attentive to patients, um, begins to see a problem that no one else is really talking about as loudly as he believes they ought to be. And he's looking for a way to be heard by them, going into the community, 
speaking to patients in really clear terms when they come into him about how this is an injustice that they do not have to accept this amputation for strategy, and then gaining the, the trust of local physicians. And through that work from 2015 when he arrived until 2017, he was able to document how these efforts allowed him to produce local results. So what he saw was a reduction of amputations by over 85% from 2014 when he first arrived to 2017, three years after he arrived. And alongside that reduction in amputations was this rise in um, peripheral angiograms. And you can see how they inversely correlate. So what happens to Henry Daughtry? Dr. Fakaridi is asked to consult on Mr. Daughtry's case. He asks the hospital if he can do an angiogram to get a roadmap to see what's happening in Mr. Daughtry's vessels. The hospital says no. They say they don't have the staff or the supplies. So Fakaridi goes to the hospital and he sees that indeed they do have the supplies. He doesn't understand why they're saying no, but he does actually know that he needs to find a way around this. So he goes to Daughtry's primary care provider whose trust he has won, and he asks her to discharge his patient from the hospital on Monday morning. This is all happening on a Saturday. So his clinic will reopen on Monday. It was actually Martin Luther King Jr. Day. It was a holiday. He decides he's going to open his clinic regardless to try to save Henry's leg. The primary care physician agrees to discharge Mr. Daughtry. And on Monday morning on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, Daughtry shows up to Dr. Fakaridi's outpatient lab. And Dr. Fakaridi performs an angiogram, um, which he believes is best practice in this case, and which many people would agree is. He finds that Daughtry's vessels are pretty patent. There's, a, there's an occlusion, but he can very easily um, open up that vessel, which is what he does. And he tells the family after um, he's done with the procedure and they're extraordinarily satisfied and grateful to Dr. Fakaridi for, for giving Henry this shot at keeping his foot. And he calls the hospital to let them know. And he, it's in that moment that he reaches a nurse at the hospital that he learns that a surgeon had actually called earlier that day to schedule an amputation that very morning. So this is one person's story that demonstrates Dr. Fakaridi's local success despite everything that he is up against. I wanna go a little bit broader now. So no matter what Dr. Fakhridi is able to do in Bolivar, he understands that he isn't going to be able to affect long lasting systemic change unless he takes his efforts to a national stage. So he follows five different routes. He's publishing his results. He's writing op-eds. He's working on a PAD initiative with the Association for Black Cardiologists. And he is also um, meeting with members of Congress and encouraging them and, and imploring them to begin work on this issue. And they do, um, a couple of members of Congress started the PAD caucus. And he's also open to letting me shadow him, right? So here I am a journalist from New York. I know very little about the issue. And he's willing to let me come in and shadow his work, which is an extremely vulnerable thing to do. Um, and that allows me to bring more national awareness to what he is working against and how he is doing that. So this is all in the process of producing pretty major results. Um, this is a bill that was introduced in Congress in October, and it is quite sweeping. 
it suggests or proposes rather that Medicare would only pay for an amputation caused by vascular disease or diabetes if the patient has received arterial testing within three months of surgery. It's also proposing that Medicare and Medicaid patients could get screening tests without cost sharing requirements. So essentially legislating into the problem that Pacaridi found with the USPSDF, making sure that patients are getting these screening tests, even if the evidence base doesn't satisfy the USPSDF right now. And this is just the beginning of this legislative effort. You know, a lot will remain to be done. The bill hasn't yet been passed, although it has been introduced. And there are still going to be um, hurdles to cross legislatively to make sure that any bill of this sort is implemented properly on the ground, perhaps with public reporting requirements or government penalties or some kind of accounting process so that people and physicians and hospitals are held accountable to best practices. So I guess I wanted to just sum up by talking about what kind of general lessons we can draw from Dr. Pakaridi's experience, which might be applicable to other physicians in this talk um, in different contexts in terms of affecting change. So there are at least three. There is this local context of being extraordinarily attentive to patients um, and being open to seeing problems you didn't know existed reaching out to other physicians to talk about what needs to change and working with them to build trusting relationships that you can provide better care for patients and then finding ways to be heard by the community. There is national outreach. So that's documenting and publishing your findings to raise awareness as any researcher would, um, you know, being involved in medical networks, trying to get your way into political networks and then also working with media to spread a message, whether that's through op-eds or through news outlets that wanna cover the work. And then it is building coalitions. So uh, Dr. Fakaridi is the co-chair of the PAD initiative at the Association for Black Cardiologists. And from this perch, he begins working with other medical bodies like the Society for Vascular Surgery, the American Podiatric, Podiatric Medical Association, the Harvard Public School of Public Health, even the association, um, sorry, the American Diabetes Association has become quite interested and started implementing new programs to address diabetic amputations. And so it is through that work that now he is able to start kind of reaching compromises um, and influencing lawmaking. Thank you. I'd love to, to take questions now. Thank you so much, Lizzie. Um, everyone, we have Lizzie, Dr. Beckman, and Dr. Fakaridi uh, back here in the panelist view. So please post any questions that you all have for any of them. Um, we have uh, at least one so far, and so I'll get started with that one, which is, uh, are the same disparities seen in the VA healthcare system where insurance issues are not as relevant? That's a really good question. And actually, I know that Dr. Beckman can answer this with me because he's been working on this. Um, the, the VA has done a much better job at coordinating interdisciplinary care just because of how the system is built. And so they've seen quite good results in terms of reducing amputation numbers. But I want to actually pass that off to Dr. Beckman to talk a little bit about disparities in VA care, if he's with us still. I am. Thanks very much, Lizzie, and what a spectacular talk. Uh, we were lucky enough to win an American Heart Association Strategically Focused Research Network Award in Vascular Disease. And we are looking at both the uh, Vanderbilt and Veterans Association populations in very large numbers to specifically figure out this question to see if it's uh, the kind of care provided in a uniform system to see how that impacts um, amputation outcomes. So that data should be forthcoming pretty soon, actually. 
and we'll have the real we'll have the known answer to that question. Can I can I add to that? Hi, Josh. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Um, first of all, Lizzie, fantastic work. I mean, I've been to a lot of conferences, and you know, usually you get bored after ten minutes, but. Um, I'm biased, but you are excellent at what you do and deserve all the award-winning awards that you've, you've ever achieved. Um, thank you again for highlighting our plight here in Mississippi. When we went to testify in Congress in 2018, um, that's myself and uh, different societies, including Sky, um, we utilized the PAVE program, Prevention and Amputation in Veterans Everywhere, which is a VA study. And we use that as kind of the highlight to show congressional bipartisan um, uh, stakeholders that you know there's a successful model that's already in place, although a closed system, where you can show that screening these patients early on and using a good multidisciplinary system, you can decrease amputation significantly. So kudos to the VA program and the PAVE program in particular um, for actually highlighting and being part of the impetus for the PAD caucus to be established a year later, 2019. Thank you. We have a number of questions rolling in, so I'm just gonna keep asking them. Um, the next one was, do academic centers perform better than private hospitals? Are we teaching these practices angiogram before amputation to upcoming physicians? Um. Lizzie, do you want to take this? You want us to I don't know. I don't know how the medical education system is working right now. So someone else should, should actually take it. Well, I'll, I'll say this. I think where there are, where there are experts in vascular disease, um, particularly vascular surgeons and interventional cardiologists and interventional radiologists who are interested and active in this disease process, they're teaching the right way to take care of these patients. But um, I think it's I think we've done an okay job at best, and that vascular disease commonly falls between the cracks of medicine, surgery, and radiology, and we really have to redouble our efforts to make clear what an epidemic this is and how we're really not addressing it appropriately. What do you think, Lucio? I think we've done a poor job because we're a fragmented space. So you have three different silos. You have vascular surgeons, interventional radiologists, and interventional cardiologists. And unlike maybe a few academic programs, <clears throat> Bandy might be one of them, where you have this multidisciplinary effort where any new upcoming um, you know, trainee in either of those specialties can cross, um, you know, cross shadow and go and see other fields to, to, to learn the PAD um, you know, and critical limb ischemia um, uh, field. Um, it's usually, it's fragmented. If you are in a center that is academic and it's monopolized by one of those specialties like vascular surgeons and you're a budding interventional cardiologist who's interested, you wouldn't get as much um, in terms of, you know, opportunities for you to really gain and, and, and go into a vascular surgeon's uh, OR or clinic and gain the same experience as, he, as the fellows who are vascular surgeons. And so we need to do a better job. I mean, I mean, we have societies that actually are multidisciplinary, like Viva and other places where we, we, we try and, and um, talk to our colleagues and, and educate and inform um, uh, trainees. But I think we need to go back and reassess our curriculums, um, not only in fellowship, but also in colleges. When we talk about PAD, you need to talk about PAD as we talk about coronary disease, heart attacks pulmonary embolisms and strokes. And we have done an okay job with others, but we need to raise more awareness in that space and allow other specialties to have that much interaction um, and fellows to have interaction at an early level and engage them in the communities that they treat. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can, but we may not uh, be able to get to all of them. Um, a couple people have asked about um, other risk factors like genetic risk factors that may explain differences in disease prevalence. Um, so to combine two questions, you know, one person was asking if the rates of amputation in Nigeria are similarly high compared to European countries or if there have been any other uh, sort of independent markers for um, peripheral vascular disease that have been identified. 
Well, uh, in terms of exact rates of amputations in Nigeria, I mean, hypertension and diabetes are high. But, you know, one thing that's inter interesting is that if you look at other markets, like the Asian market, their amputation rates are very high um, in the Asian market. Um, are there genetic reasons in play? I think more so social determinants of health is in play when you talk about amputation rates or any health disparity. So unless, uh, until we acknowledge and address the social determinants of health in our, in, in our country, but also in other regions, that is at the core, the underbelly and underpinning of this epidemic uh, when you look at uh, things across the board. So it's education inequity, economic inequity, access to quality care, um, not just access to care, and then addressing our food deserts and you know, social context, discrimination is in play, um, and also the healthcare coverage and access to quality healthcare coverage. Um, I, I think that's more of a better approach. Hey, Lizzie, can you talk about what you, how you see this and how the social determinants of health and socioeconomic status impact what, you're, what you've seen? No, I mean, I, can, I think Felucia said it exactly as I see it as well. I, I, um, I think there's this whole new wave of social scientists and researchers, medical researchers right now who have begun recasting type two diabetes, not simply as uh, a condition of genes or personal responsibility, but one that's triggered by overlapping determinants like childhood stress, like uh, racism, like uh, access to food, access to quality care, access to exercise spaces. Um, so instead of thinking about type two diabetes, there has been this new push to be, uh, sorry, instead of thinking of it as a disease of responsibility and personal responsibility, there is this new push to be thinking about it as structural, uh, a structural disease in some senses, like the ways in which people don't have access to the quality of life and the quality of care that they deserve. Thank you. Uh, someone else was asking uh, if you could expand a little bit more on the barriers with financial uh, incentives, um, commenting that you mentioned that revascularization is not reimbursed um, as much as amputation. Is that true of both endovascular and surgical revascularization? Is there any effort to change this or potential change coming? I'll just start, but I'll pass it off to Felucio because he'll know a little bit more about the changes in play. Um, what I was trying to explain was that in many of these hospitals, there is no vascular surgeon. And so a general surgeon is going to be financially incentivized to cut because they aren't the surgeon who would do an, an endovascular procedure necessarily. Um, so what I mean by, mean by there is this kind of bifurcation of roles. A general surgeon isn't going to be able to do the kind of thing that Dr. Fakaridi does. And so it is not financially beneficial for him to recommend it. In terms of the financial incentives, I know there was recently actually a pay cut to endovascular specialists, but I think uh, Dr. Fakaridi can explain more on that. Well, just, just in general, I mean, I think, you know, what we're trying to advocate here is that some form of revascularization, be it either surgical, uh, which is bypass, or endovascular should be in play before you amputate. Um, we've, so those studies have shown that going either with endovascular or bypass is actually um, cheaper and affordable to both the patient and more um, economical for the hospital than going with an amputation for a strategy. Um, and so in terms of incentives, um, the hospitals lose when you amputate. Um, the patients lose, their families lose, um, the surgeons might gain. And this is not to cast some kind of general um, uh, net on all surgeons. They're just particularly in certain rural areas and where you lack vascular, true vascular surgeons, and sometimes it's either a general surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon, you do find that amputation rates are higher and, and, and we need to address that. It is an epidemic. Um, and so the moral consciousness of people needs to be awoken and that's what's happening. And that's what you're seeing by us highlighting this today. Um, Thank you. Um, we have so many questions in the chat and a lot of uh, sort of great comments still. I think we'll go um, a little bit over 9 a.m. today, uh, just so we can address some more of these questions. So the next one uh, came from 
one of our residents, um, and she asked, given the systemic barriers to change in amputations, what can individual clinicians do to advocate for change? Lizzie, why don't you start? Yeah, Lizzie. I'd love to Lizzie. know how you think we should penetrate the public's consciousness. Oh my gosh, it's so complicated. I mean, I think part of why I was interested in telling Dr. Pakaridi's story is because that was the question that he was faced with. And what I was trying to demonstrate was that he took this on in a number of different ways, right? So if, he, if you are working in a part of the country where you are seeing these patients not getting the care that you believe could better serve them, it starts with really doing the work locally and trying to spread awareness there. Um, but again, that doesn't get to your point about systemic change. So there is this now legislative movement. And at a certain point, when that legislation reaches a certain, certain stage, it's going to be really important for members of Congress to hear from clinicians about why they see that this is critical to do. In some ways, it goes against what some lawmakers are willing to say because lawmakers are quite hesitant usually to legislate physician practices and so how do we get around that problem if we're seeing that physicians generally aren't following the national guidelines or society guidelines and congress isn't necessarily so keen to legislate on it we we need to find some kind of a compromise the only thing i'll add to that is for any any resident or fellow who's watching this um, we are at an intersection where courage and compassion come to play in medicine and the courage is to speak out against inhumane practices that you see, irrespective of where you are, um, because of all forms of injustices, as Martin Luther King said in 1966, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So, you know, it's having the mentorship um, to find that mentor who can guide you, understanding the chronic burdens of health in America, and seeing where you can have an impact or a voice either locally, regionally, and nationally. And from a policy standpoint, getting involved in policy yeah. is not to change people's heart. It is to restrain the heartless. So that is just the main topics and the main things that we wanted to highlight in, the, in, 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 in engaging Lizzie and talking to her, that this can be done anywhere. You just need to have that you know, that courage and, and that intersection of compassion to say, well, we want to affect change intergenerationally. And um, we thank her for her work because it's just a, you know, ex 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 excellent presentation of the, the topic. I, I will say one more thing, just th listening to Dr. Fakhridi speak is that I found Dr. Fakhridi because he had written these pretty strongly worded op-eds and they weren't in major newspapers. You know, they were sometimes just on blogs. But I was like, oh, this is a doctor who really deeply cares about this problem and he sees an injustice. And that's a doctor I'm interested in understanding more from because he's willing to speak out in that way. And so I think if you are seeing problems of this sort, I would also encourage you to speak really boldly about what you see as the problem. I would also just make, uh, I'm gonna answer one of the questions in the chat and add on here, I think as a trainee, the most important thing you could do is do the right thing by the patient. So when you think someone may have peripheral artery disease, you should get them tested to see if they have it and treat them appropriately. I think at this level, just doing the right thing, communicating with patients, communicating with peers, and walking the walk and talking the talk is a good place to start. There are ways to work to do it as Dr. Fakariti did, which I will tell you is very difficult, and he deserves a tremendous amount of kudos. But there are also ways to work through national organizations like the Association of Black Cardiologists, the American Heart Association, uh, SVS, SIR, ACC, where they are all interested in these issues and have different methods of interacting with uh, national decision makers. And the more we push them in the right direction, the truth is we are them. And so getting involved in larger organizations is another method of doing this um, where I think we can come together as groups and make a louder noise. And I, I also wanted to mention that, you know, as much as this is the black amputation epidemic, you know, I live in Mississippi, they're, you know, 40% African American, but there are 60% are, you know, Caucasian. There is an amputation epidemic in that population as well. Um, so let's not just ignore that. We're highlighting the disproportionately affected. 
but but this occurs across the board, even in Nashville. You know, I mean, Josh, Josh, Josh knows this. Um, and so kudos to everyone that's involved. It, it, it takes a lot of stakeholders to, to, to address this epidemic, but we, we just have to start by going to the deep roots and encouraging and incentivizing um, our primary care docs to be more vigilant. Um, that's it, just be more vigilant in terms of assessing. And the primary management of PAD is not an intervention. It's actually addressing the risk factors of these patients who are at risk over age over 50, you're a diabetic, you have high blood pressure, you have nicotine use, not just people who smoke, people who dip, who chew nicotine are at risk. Anyone who's had any form of heart attack or stroke, anyone who has end-stage renal disease or a family history of peripheral vascular disease, treat them, treat their risk factors so that you can decrease their chances of having subsequent stroke, heart attack, or an amputation. That's the message here. It's not just doing a procedure, it's actually becoming a preventative specialist, cardiologist, vascular surgeon, or interventional radiologist. All right, great. I want, I want to just thank um, Lizzie for a fabulous presentation, Dr. Farkaridi for all your insights and what you're doing, and Josh for putting this on our radar. This has really, really been um, a tremendous uh, grand rounds. Um, I'm glad to say that we'll be able to put it out on YouTube. I think many, many people need to watch this, and just thank you all. We'll revisit this as we go. Yeah. Thank you so much. Tons of uh, tons of um, praise and thanks in the chat. Uh, people are really um, thankful that you brought this uh, to our attention or sort of spreading the word. Um, and for those of you who are uh, non-Vanderbilt people on our departmental website by tomorrow, there should be a link to this talk to be able to dis disseminate it uh, more widely. And we also have a question uh, from someone uh, for Lizzie and Dr. Faccarini and Dr. Beckman in the chat about um, wondering where they can do some more reading on the topic. So thank you all so much for being with us. We really, really appreciate it. Thanks so much. I, if we, um, I can shoot you guys some reading too and maybe you can distribute that if that's helpful. That sounds great, thank you. Thank you.